Jewelry British English or jewelry American English, see spelling differences consists of small decorative items worn for personal adornment, such as brooches, rings, necklaces, earrings, pendants, bracelets, and cufflinks. Jewelry may be attached to the body or the clothes. From a Western perspective, the term is restricted to durable ornaments, excluding flowers for example. For many centuries metal, often combined with gemstones, has been the normal material for jewelry, but other materials such as shells and other plant materials may be used. It is one of the oldest type of archaeological artifact, with 100,000-year-old beads made from Nasarius shells thought to be the oldest known jewelry. The basic forms of jewelry vary between cultures but are often extremely long-lived. In European cultures the most common forms of jewelry listed above have persisted since ancient times, while other forms such as adornments for the nose or ankle, important in other cultures, are much less common. Jewelry may be made from a wide range of materials. Gemstones and similar materials such as amber and coral, precious metals, beads, and shells have been widely used, and enamel has often been important. In most cultures jewelry can be understood as a status symbol, for its material properties, its patterns, or for meaningful symbols. Jewelry has been made to adorn nearly every body part, from hairpins to toe rings, and even genital jewelry. The patterns of wearing jewelry between the sexes, and by children and older people can vary greatly between cultures, but adult women have been the most consistent wearers of jewelry. In modern European culture the amount worn by adult males is relatively low compared with other cultures and other periods in European culture. The word jewelry itself is derived from the word jewel, which was anglicized from the Old French, jewel, and beyond that, to the Latin word, jocal meaning plaything. In British English, Indian English, New Zealand English, Hiberno-English, Australian English, and South African English it is spelled jewellery, while the spelling is jewellery in American English. Both are used in Canadian English, though jewellery prevails by a two-to-one margin. In French and a few other European languages the equivalent term, joillery, may also cover decorated metalwork in precious metals such as objects d'ar and church items, not just objects worn on the person. Topic. Form and function Humans have used jewellery for a number of different reasons. Functional, generally to fix clothing or hair in place. As a marker of social status and personal status, as with a wedding ring. As a signifier of some form of affiliation, whether ethnic, religious or social. To provide talismanic protection in the form of amulets. As an artistic display. As a carrier or symbol of personal meaning, such as love, mourning, or even luck most cultures at some point have had a practice of keeping large amounts of wealth stored in the form of jewelry. Numerous cultures store wedding dowries in the form of jewelry or make jewelry as a means to store or display coins. Alternatively, jewelry has been used as a currency or trade good, an example being the use of slave beads. Many items of jewelry, such as brooches and buckles, originated as purely functional items, but evolved into decorative items as their functional requirement diminished. Jewelry can also symbolize group membership, as in the case of the Christian crucifix or the Jewish Star of David, or status, as in the case of chains of office, or the Western practice of married people wearing wedding rings. Wearing of amulets and devotional medals to provide protection or ward off evil is common in some cultures. These may take the form of symbols such as the ankh, stones, plants, animals, body parts such as the kamsa, or glyphs such as stylized versions of the throne verse in Islamic art. Topic: <laughs> Materials and methods. In creating jewelry, gemstones, coins, or other precious items are often used, and they are typically set into precious metals. Platinum alloys range from 900 90% pure to 950 95.0% pure. The silver used in jewelry is usually sterling silver, or 92.5% fine silver. In costume jewelry, stainless steel findings are sometimes used. 
Other commonly used materials include glass, such as fused glass or enamel, wood, often carved or turned, shells and other natural animal substances such as bone and ivory, natural clay, polymer clay, hemp and other twines have been used as well to create jewelry that has more of a natural feel. However, any inclusion of lead or lead solder will give a British assay office the body which gives UK jewellery its stamp of approval, the hallmark the right to destroy the piece, however it is very rare for the assay office to do so. Beads are frequently used in jewellery. These may be made of glass, gemstones, metal, wood, shells, clay and polymer clay. Beaded jewellery commonly encompasses necklaces, bracelets, earrings, belts and rings. Beads may be large or small, the smallest type of beads used are known as seed beads, these are the beads used for the woven style of beaded jewelry. Seed beads are also used in an embroidery technique where they are sewn onto fabric backings to create broad collar neck pieces and beaded bracelets. Bead embroidery, a popular type of handwork during the Victorian era, is enjoying a renaissance in modern jewelry making. Beading, or beadwork, is also very popular in many African and indigenous North American cultures. Silversmiths, goldsmiths, and lapidaries methods include forging, casting, soldering or welding, cutting, carving and cold joining, using adhesives, staples and rivets to assemble parts. Topic. Diamonds. Diamonds were first mined in India. Pliny may have mentioned them, although there is some debate as to the exact nature of the stone he referred to as Adamas. In 2005, Australia, Botswana, Russia and Canada ranked among the primary sources of gemstone diamond production. There are negative consequences of the diamond trade in certain areas. Diamonds mined during the recent civil wars in Angola, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, and other nations have been labeled as blood diamonds when they are mined in a war zone and sold to finance an insurgency. The British Crown Jewels contain the Cullinan Diamond, part of the largest gem quality rough diamond ever found 1905, at 3,106.75 carats 621.35 grams. Now popular in engagement rings, this usage dates back to the marriage of Maximilian I to Mary of Burgundy in 1477. Topic: Other gemstones. Many precious and semi-precious stones are used for jewelry. Among them are amber Amber, an ancient organic gemstone, is composed of tree resin that has hardened over time. The stone must be at least 1 million years old to be classified as amber, and some amber can be up to 120 million years old. Amethyst Amethyst has historically been the most prized gemstone in the quartz family. It is treasured for its purple hue, which can range in tone from light to dark. Emerald Emeralds are one of the three main precious gemstones along with rubies and sapphires and are known for their fine green to bluish green color. They have been treasured throughout history, and some historians report that the Egyptians mined emerald as early as 3500 BC. Jade Jade is most commonly associated with the color green but can come in a number of other colors as well. Jade is closely linked to Asian culture, history, and tradition, and is sometimes referred to as the Stone of Heaven. Jasper Jasper is a gemstone of the Chalcedony family that comes in a variety of colors. Often, jasper will feature unique and interesting patterns within the colored stone. Picture jasper as a type of jasper known for the colors often beiges and browns and swirls in the stone's pattern. Quartz Quartz refers to a family of crystalline gemstones of various colors and sizes. Among the well-known types of quartz are rose quartz, which has a delicate pink color, and smoky quartz, which comes in a variety of shades of translucent brown. A number of other gemstones, such as amethyst and citrine, are also part of the quartz family. Rutilated quartz is a popular type of quartz containing needle-like inclusions. Ruby Rubies are known for their intense red color and are among the most highly valued precious gemstones. 
Rubies have been treasured for millennia. In Sanskrit, the word for ruby is Ratnaraj, meaning king of precious stones. Sapphire The most popular form of sapphire is blue sapphire, which is known for its medium to deep blue color and strong saturation. Fancy sapphires of various colors are also available. In the United States, blue sapphire tends to be the most popular and most affordable of the three major precious gemstones emerald, ruby, and sapphire. Turquoise Turquoise is found in only a few places on Earth, and the world's largest turquoise-producing region is the southwest United States. Turquoise is prized for its attractive color, most often an intense medium blue or a greenish blue, and its ancient heritage. Turquoise is used in a great variety of jewelry styles. It is perhaps most closely associated with Southwest and Native American jewelry, but it is also used in many sleek, modern styles. Some turquoise contains a matrix of dark brown markings, which provides an interesting contrast to the gemstone's bright blue color. Some gemstones like pearls, coral, and amber are classified as organic, meaning that they are produced by living organisms. Others are inorganic, meaning that they are generally composed of and arise from minerals. Some gems, for example, amethyst, have become less valued as methods of extracting and importing them have progressed. Some man-made gems can serve in place of natural gems, such as cubic zirconia, which can be used in place of diamond. Topic. Metal finishes For platinum, gold, and silver jewelry, there are many techniques to create finishes. The most common are high polish, satin, matte, brushed, and hammered. High polished jewelry is the most common and gives the metal a highly reflective, shiny look. Satin, or matte finish reduces the shine and reflection of the jewelry, and this is commonly used to accentuate gemstones such as diamonds. Brushed finishes give the jewelry a textured look and are created by brushing a material similar to sandpaper against the metal, leaving brush strokes. Hammered finishes are typically created by using a rounded steel hammer and hammering the jewelry to give it a wavy texture. Some jewelry is plated to give it a shiny, reflective look or to achieve a desired color. Sterling silver jewelry may be plated with a thin layer of 0.999 fine silver a process known as flashing or may be plated with rhodium or gold. Base metal costume jewelry may also be plated with silver, gold, or rhodium for a more attractive finish. Topic. Impact on society Jewelry has been used to denote status. In ancient Rome, only certain ranks could wear rings, later, sumptuary laws dictated who could wear what type of jewelry. This was also based on rank of the citizens of that time. Cultural dictates have also played a significant role. For example, the wearing of earrings by Western men was considered effeminate in the 19th century and early 20th century. More recently, the display of body jewelry, such as piercings, has become a mark of acceptance or seen as a badge of courage within some groups but is completely rejected in others. Likewise, hip-hop culture has popularized the slang term bling-bling, which refers to ostentatious display of jewelry by men or women. Conversely, the jewelry industry in the early 20th century launched a campaign to popularize wedding rings for men, which caught on, as well as engagement rings for men, which did not, going so far as to create a false history and claim that the practice had medieval roots. By the mid-1940s, 85% of weddings in the U.S. featured a double ring ceremony, up from 15% in the 1920s. Religion has also played a role in society's influence. Islam, for instance, considers the wearing of gold by men as a social taboo, and many religions have edicts against excessive display. In Christianity, the New Testament gives injunctions against the wearing of gold, in the writings of the apostles Paul and Peter. In Revelation chapter 17, the great whore, or false religious system, is depicted as being decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. Rev. 17-4 For Muslims it is considered haram for a man to wear gold. 
Christian denominations forbidding the use of jewelry by both men and women include Amish Mennonites and Holiness Churches. History The history of jewelry is long and goes back many years, with many different uses among different cultures. It has endured for thousands of years and has provided various insights into how ancient cultures worked. Topic: Prehistory. The earliest known jewelry was actually created not by humans, Homo sapiens, but by Neanderthal living in Europe. Specifically, perforated beads made from small sea shells have been found dating to 115,000 years ago in the Cueva de los Aviones, a cave along the southeast coast of Spain. Later in Kenya, at Nkapune ya Muto, beads made from perforated ostrich egg shells have been dated to more than 40,000 years ago. In Russia, a stone bracelet and marble ring are attributed to a similar age. Later, the European early modern humans had crude necklaces and bracelets of bone, teeth, berries, and stone hung on pieces of string or animal sinew, or pieces of carved bone used to secure clothing together. In some cases, jewelry had shell or mother of pearl pieces. A decorated engraved pendant, the star car pendant dating to around 11,000 BC, and thought to be the oldest Mesolithic art in Britain, was found at the site of Star Car in North Yorkshire in 2015. In southern Russia, carved bracelets made of mammoth tusk have been found. The Venus of Whole Fells features a perforation at the top, showing that it was intended to be worn as a pendant. Around 7,000 years ago, the first sign of copper jewellery was seen. In October 2012 the Museum of Ancient History in Lower Austria revealed that they had found a grave of a female jewellery worker, forcing archaeologists to take a fresh look at prehistoric gender roles after it appeared to be that of a female fine metal worker, a profession that was previously thought to have been carried out exclusively by men. Egypt. The first signs of established jewellery making in ancient Egypt was around 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. The Egyptians preferred the luxury, rarity, and workability of gold over other metals. In pre-dynastic Egypt jewellery soon began to symbolize political and religious power in the community. Although it was worn by wealthy Egyptians in life, it was also worn by them in death, with jewellery commonly placed among grave goods. In conjunction with gold jewelry, Egyptians used colored glass, along with semi-precious gems. The color of the jewelry had significance. Green, for example, symbolized fertility. Lapis lazuli and silver had to be imported from beyond the country's borders. Egyptian designs were most common in Phoenician jewelry. Also, ancient Turkish designs found in Persian jewelry suggest that trade between the Middle East and Europe was not uncommon. Women wore elaborate gold and silver pieces that were used in ceremonies. Topic: <inaudible> Europe and the Middle East. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Mesopotamia. By approximately 5,000 years ago, jewelry making had become a significant craft in the cities of Mesopotamia. The most significant archaeological evidence comes from the Royal Cemetery of Ur, where hundreds of burials dating 2900-2300 BC were unearthed. Tombs such as that of Puabi contained a multitude of artifacts in gold, silver, and semi-precious stones, such as lapis lazuli crowns embellished with gold figurines, close-fitting collar necklaces, and jewel-headed pins. In Assyria, men and women both wore extensive amounts of jewelry, including amulets, ankle bracelets, heavy multi strand necklaces, and cylinder seals. Jewelry in Mesopotamia tended to be manufactured from thin metal leaf and was set with large numbers of brightly colored stones, chiefly agate, lapis, carnelian, and jasper. Favored shapes included leaves, spirals, cones, and bunches of grapes. Jewelers created works both for human use and for adorning statues and idols. 
They employed a wide variety of sophisticated metalworking techniques, such as cloisonné, engraving, fine granulation, and filigree. Extensive and meticulously maintained records pertaining to the trade and manufacture of jewelry have also been unearthed throughout Mesopotamian archaeological sites. One record in the Mari Royal Archives, for example, gives the composition of various items of jewelry. One necklace of flat speckled chalcedony beads including, 34 flat speckled chalcedony bead, and 35 gold fluted beads, in groups of five. One necklace of flat speckled chalcedony beads including, 39 flat speckled chalcedony beads, with 41 fluted beads in a group that make up the hanging device. One necklace with rounded lapis lazuli beads including, 28 rounded lapis lazuli beads, and, 29 fluted beads for its clasp. Topic. Greece The Greeks started using gold and gems in jewellery in 1600 BC, although beads shaped as shells and animals were produced widely in earlier times. Around 1500 BC, the main techniques of working gold in Greece included casting, twisting bars, and making wire. Many of these sophisticated techniques were popular in the Mycenaean period, but unfortunately this skill was lost at the end of the Bronze Age. The forms and shapes of jewelry in ancient Greece such as the armoring 13th century BC, brooch 10th century BC, and pins 7th century BC have varied widely since the Bronze Age as well. Other forms of jewelry include wreaths, earrings, necklace and bracelets. A good example of the high quality that gold working techniques could achieve in Greece is the gold olive wreath 4th century BC, which is modeled on the type of wreath given as a prize for winners in athletic competitions like the Olympic Games. Jewelry dating from 600 to 475 BC is not well represented in the archaeological record, but after the Persian Wars the quantity of jewelry again became more plentiful. One particularly popular type of design at this time was a bracelet decorated with snake and animal heads because these bracelets used considerably more metal, many examples were made from bronze. By 300 BC, the Greeks had mastered making colored jewelry and using amethysts, pearl, and emeralds. Also, the first signs of cameos appeared, with the Greeks creating them from Indian sardonyx, a striped brown pink and cream agate stone. Greek jewelry was often simpler than in other cultures, with simple designs and workmanship. However, as time progressed, the designs grew in complexity and different materials were soon used. Jewelry in Greece was hardly worn and was mostly used for public appearances or on special occasions. It was frequently given as a gift and was predominantly worn by women to show their wealth, social status, and beauty. The jewelry was often supposed to give the wearer protection from the evil eye, or endowed the owner with supernatural powers, while others had a religious symbolism. Older pieces of jewelry that have been found were dedicated to the gods. They worked two styles of pieces, cast pieces and pieces hammered out of sheet metal. Fewer pieces of cast jewelry have been recovered. It was made by casting the metal onto two stone or clay molds. The two halves were then joined together, and wax, followed by molten metal, was placed in the center. This technique had been practiced since the late Bronze Age. The more common form of jewelry was the hammered sheet type. Sheets of metal would be hammered to thickness and then soldered together. The inside of the two sheets would be filled with wax or another liquid to preserve the metal work. Different techniques, such as using a stamp or engraving, were then used to create motifs on the jewelry. Jewels may then be added to hollows or glass poured into special cavities on the surface. The Greeks took much of their designs from outer origins, such as Asia, when Alexander the Great conquered part of it. In earlier designs, other European influences can also be detected. When Roman rule came to Greece, no change in jewelry designs was detected. However, by 27 BC, Greek designs were heavily influenced by the Roman culture. That is not to say that indigenous design did not thrive. Numerous polychrome butterfly pendants on silver foxtail chains, dating from the 1st century, have been found near Albia, with only one example ever found anywhere else.
Topic: Etruscan. Gorgons, pomegranates, acorns, lotus flowers and palms were a clear indicator of Greek influence in Etruscan jewelry. The modeling of heads, which was a typical practice from the Greek severe period, was a technique that spread throughout the Etruscan territory. An even clearer evidence of new influences is the shape introduced in the Orientalizing era, the bully. A pear-shaped vessel used to hold perfume. Its surface was usually decorated with repose and engraved symbolic figures. Much of the jewelry found was not worn by Etruscans, but were made to accompany them in the afterworld. Most, if not all, techniques of Etruscan goldsmiths were not invented by them as they are dated to the 3rd millennium BC. Topic Rome Although jewellery work was abundantly diverse in earlier times, especially among the barbarian tribes such as the Celts, when the Romans conquered most of Europe, jewellery was changed as smaller factions developed the Roman designs. The most common artifact of early Rome was the brooch, which was used to secure clothing together. The Romans used a diverse range of materials for their jewellery from their extensive resources across the continent. Although they used gold, they sometimes used bronze or bone, and in earlier times, glass beads and pearl. As early as 2000 years ago, they imported Sri Lankan sapphires and Indian diamonds and used emeralds and amber in their jewellery. In Roman-ruled England, fossilized wood called jet from northern England was often carved into pieces of jewellery. The early Italians worked in crude gold and created clasps, necklaces, earrings, and bracelets. They also produced larger pendants that could be filled with perfume. Like the Greeks, often the purpose of Roman jewelry was to ward off the evil eye given by other people. Although women wore a vast array of jewelry, men often only wore a finger ring. Although they were expected to wear at least one ring, some Roman men wore a ring on every finger, while others wore none. Roman men and women wore rings with an engraved gem on it that was used with wax to seal documents, a practice that continued into medieval times when kings and noblemen used the same method. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the jewelry designs were absorbed by neighboring countries and tribes. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Middle Ages. Post-Roman Europe continued to develop jewelry-making skills. The Celts and Merovingians in particular are noted for their jewelry, which in terms of quality matched or exceeded that of the Byzantine Empire. Clothing fasteners, amulets, and, to a lesser extent, signet rings, are the most common artifacts known to us. A particularly striking Celtic example is the Terra brooch. The torque was common throughout Europe as a symbol of status and power. By the 8th century, jeweled weaponry was common for men, while other jewelry with the exception of signet rings seemed to become the domain of women. Grave goods found in a 6th-7th century burial near chalon sur seyon are illustrative. A young girl was buried with two silver fibulae, a necklace with coins, bracelet, gold earrings, a pair of hair pins, comb, and buckle. The Celts specialized in continuous patterns and designs, while Merovingian designs are best known for stylized animal figures. They were not the only groups known for high-quality work. Note the Visigoth work shown here, and the numerous decorative objects found at the Anglo-Saxon ship burial at Sutton Hoo Suffolk, England are a particularly well-known example. On the continent, cloisonné and garnet were perhaps the quintessential method and gemstone of the period. The eastern successor of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, continued many of the methods of the Romans, though religious themes came to predominate. Unlike the Romans, the Franks, and the Celts, however, Byzantium used lightweight gold leaf rather than solid gold, and more emphasis was placed on stones and gems. As in the West, Byzantine jewelry was worn by wealthier females, with male jewelry apparently restricted to signet rings. Woman's jewelry had some peculiarities like colts that decorated headband. Like other contemporary cultures, jewelry was commonly buried with its owner. Topic: <inaudible> Renaissance. The Renaissance and exploration both had significant impacts on the development of jewelry in Europe. 
By the 17th century, increasing exploration and trade led to increased availability of a wide variety of gemstones as well as exposure to the art of other cultures. Whereas prior to this the working of gold and precious metal had been at the forefront of jewelry, this period saw increasing dominance of gemstones and their settings. An example of this is the Cheapside Hoard, the stock of a jeweler hidden in London during the Commonwealth period and not found again until 1912. It contained Colombian emerald, topaz, amazonite from Brazil, spinel, iolite, and chrysoberyl from Sri Lanka, ruby from India, Afghan lapis lazuli, Persian turquoise, Red Sea peridot, as well as Bohemian and Hungarian opal, garnet, and amethyst. Large stones were frequently set in box bezels on enameled rings. Notable among merchants of the period was Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, who brought the precursor stone of the Hope Diamond to France in the 1660s. When Napoleon Bonaparte was crowned as Emperor of the French in 1804, he revived the style and grandeur of jewellery and fashion in France. Under Napoleon's rule, jewellers introduced perers, suites of matching jewellery, such as a diamond tiara, diamond earrings, diamond rings, a diamond brooch, and a diamond necklace. Both of Napoleon's wives had beautiful sets such as these and wore them regularly. Another fashion trend resurrected by Napoleon was the cameo. Soon after his cameo decorated crown was seen, cameos were highly sought. The period also saw the early stages of costume jewelry, with fish scale covered glass beads in place of pearls or conch shell cameos instead of stone cameos. New terms were coined to differentiate the arts, jewelers who worked in cheaper materials were called bijoutiers, while jewelers who worked with expensive materials were called joailliers, a practice which continues to this day. Topic Romanticism Starting in the late 18th century, Romanticism had a profound impact on the development of Western jewelry. Perhaps the most significant influences were the public's fascination with the treasures being discovered through the birth of modern archaeology and a fascination with medieval and Renaissance art. Changing social conditions and the onset of the Industrial Revolution also led to growth of a middle class that wanted and could afford jewelry. As a result, the use of industrial processes, cheaper alloys, and stone substitutes led to the development of paste or costume jewelry. Distinguished goldsmiths continued to flourish, however, as wealthier patrons sought to ensure that what they wore still stood apart from the jewellery of the masses, not only through use of precious metals and stones but also those superior artistic and technical work. One such artist was the French goldsmith François Désiré Fromont Maurice. A category unique to this period and quite appropriate to the philosophy of Romanticism was mourning jewellery. It originated in England, where Queen Victoria was often seen wearing jet jewellery after the death of Prince Albert, and it allowed the wearer to continue wearing jewellery while expressing a state of mourning at the death of a loved one. In the United States, this period saw the founding in 1837 of Tiffany & Co. by Charles Louis Tiffany. Tiffany's put the United States on the world map in terms of jewellery and gained fame creating dazzling commissions for people such as the wife of Abraham Lincoln. Later, it would gain popular notoriety as the setting of the film Breakfast at Tiffany's. In France, Pierre Cartier founded Cartier Saw in 1847, while 1884 saw the founding of Bulgari in Italy. The modern production studio had been born and was a step away from the former dominance of individual craftsmen and patronage. This period also saw the first major collaboration between East and West. Collaboration in Forsheim between German and Japanese artists led to Shakudo plaques set into filigree frames being created by the Steffler firm in 1885. Perhaps the grand finale and an appropriate transition to the following period, were the masterful creations of the Russian artist Peter Karl Fabergé, working for the Imperial Russian court, whose Fabergé eggs and jewellery pieces are still considered as the epitome of the goldsmith's art. Topic: 18th Century Romanticism Renaissance. Many whimsical fashions were introduced in the extravagant 18th century. Cameos that were used in connection with jewelry were the attractive trinkets, along with many of the small objects such as brooches, ear rings, and scarf pins. 
Some of the necklets were made of several pieces joined with the gold chains were in and bracelets were also made sometimes to match the necklet and the brooch. At the end of the century the jewellery with cut steel intermixed with large crystals was introduced by an Englishman, Matthew Boulton of Birmingham. Topic Art Nouveau In the 1890s, jewelers began to explore the potential of the growing Art Nouveau style and the closely related German Jugendstil, British and to some extent American arts and crafts movement, Catalan Modernisme, Austro-Hungarian Secession, Italian Liberty, etc. Art Nouveau jewelry encompassed many distinct features including a focus on the female form and an emphasis on color, most commonly rendered through the use of enameling techniques including basse tale, champlevé, cloisonné, and plique jour. Motifs included orchids, irises, pansies, vines, swans, peacocks, snakes, dragonflies, mythological creatures, and the female silhouette. René Lalique, working for the Paris shop of Samuel Bing, was recognized by contemporaries as a leading figure in this trend. The Darmstadt Artists' Colony and Wienerwerkstatt provided perhaps the most significant input to the trend, while in Denmark Georg Jensen, though best known for his silverware, also contributed significant pieces. In England, Liberty & Co., notably through the Cymric designs of Archibald Knox and the British arts and crafts movement of Charles Robert Ashby contributed slightly more linear but still characteristic designs. The new style moved the focus of the jeweler's art from the setting of stones to the artistic design of the piece itself. Lalique's dragonfly design is one of the best examples of this. Enamels played a large role in technique, while sinuous organic lines are the most recognizable design feature. The end of World War I once again changed public attitudes, and a more sober style developed. <laughs> Art Deco Growing political tensions, the after-effects of the war, and a reaction against the perceived decadence of the turn of the 20th century led to simpler forms, combined with more effective manufacturing for mass production of high-quality jewelry. Covering the period of the 1920s and 1930s, the style has become popularly known as Art Deco. Walter Gropius and the German Bauhaus movement, with their philosophy of no barriers between artists and craftsmen led to some interesting and stylistically simplified forms. Modern materials were also introduced, plastics and aluminium were first used in jewellery, and of note are the chromed pendants of Russian-born Bauhaus master Nam Slutsky. Technical mastery became as valued as the material itself. In the West, this period saw the reinvention of granulation by the German Elizabeth Tresco, although development of the reinvention has continued into the 1990s. It is based on the basic shapes. Topic. Asia In Asia, the Indian subcontinent has the longest continuous legacy of jewellery making anywhere, with a history of over 5,000 years. One of the first to start jewellery making were the peoples of the Indus Valley Civilization, in what is now predominantly modern-day Pakistan and part of northern and western India. Early jewellery making in China started around the same period, but it became widespread with the spread of Buddhism around 2,000 years ago. China The Chinese used silver in their jewellery more than gold. Blue kingfisher feathers were tied onto early Chinese jewellery and later, blue gems and glass were incorporated into designs. However, jade was preferred over any other stone. The Chinese revered jade because of the human-like qualities they assigned to it, such as its hardness, durability, and beauty. The first jade pieces were very simple, but as time progressed, more complex designs evolved. Jade rings from between the 4th and 7th centuries BC show evidence of having been worked with a compound milling machine, hundreds of years before the first mention of such equipment in the West. In China, the most uncommon piece of jewelry is the earring, which was worn neither by men nor women. Amulets were common, often with a Chinese symbol or dragon. Dragons, Chinese symbols, and phoenixes were frequently depicted on jewelry designs. 
the Chinese often placed their jewelry in their graves. Most Chinese graves found by archaeologists contain decorative jewelry. Topic: <inaudible> Indian subcontinent. The Indian subcontinent has a long jewelry history, which went through various changes through cultural influence and politics for more than 5000 to 8000 years. Because India had an abundant supply of precious metals and gems, it prospered financially through export and exchange with other countries. While European traditions were heavily influenced by waxing and waning empires, India enjoyed a continuous development of art forms for some 5,000 years. One of the first to start jewellery making were the peoples of the Indus Valley Civilization encompassing present-day Pakistan and North and Northwest India. By 1500 BC, the peoples of the Indus Valley were creating gold earrings and necklaces, bead necklaces, and metallic bangles. Before 2100 BC, prior to the period when metals were widely used, the largest jewellery trade in the Indus Valley region was the bead trade. Beads in the Indus Valley were made using simple techniques. First, a bead maker would need a rough stone, which would be bought from an eastern stone trader. The stone would then be placed into a hot oven where it would be heated until it turned deep red, a color highly prized by people of the Indus Valley. The red stone would then be chipped to the right size and a hole bored through it with primitive drills. The beads were then polished. Some beads were also painted with designs. This art form was often passed down through the family. Children of bead makers often learned how to work beads from a young age. Persian style also played a big role in India's jewellery. Each stone had its own characteristics related to Hinduism. Jewellery in the Indus Valley was worn predominantly by females, who wore numerous clay or shell bracelets on their wrists. They were often shaped like doughnuts and painted black. Over time, clay bangles were discarded for more durable ones. In present-day India, bangles are made out of metal or glass. Other pieces that women frequently wore were thin bands of gold that would be worn on the forehead, earrings, primitive brooches, chokers, and gold rings. Although women wore jewelry the most, some men in the Indus Valley wore beads. Small beads were often crafted to be placed in men and women's hair. The beads were about one millimeter long. A female skeleton presently on display at the National Museum, New Delhi, India wears a Carlinian bangle bracelet on her left hand. Kada is a special kind of bracelet and is widely popular in Indian culture. They symbolize animals such as peacock, elephant, etc. According to Hindu belief, gold and silver are considered as sacred metals. Gold is symbolic of the warm sun, while silver suggests the cool moon. Both are the quintessential metals of Indian jewellery. Pure gold does not oxidize or corrode with time, which is why Hindu tradition associates gold with immortality. Gold imagery occurs frequently in ancient Indian literature. In the Vedic Hindu belief of cosmological creation, the source of physical and spiritual human life originated in and evolved from a golden womb or egg a metaphor of the sun, whose light rises from the primordial waters. Jewelry had great status with India's royalty, it was so powerful that they established laws, limiting wearing of jewelry to royalty. Only royalty and a few others to whom they granted permission could wear gold ornaments on their feet. This would normally be considered breaking the appreciation of the sacred metals. Even though the majority of the Indian population wore jewellery, Maharajas and people related to royalty had a deeper connection with jewellery. The Maharaja's role was so important that the Hindu philosophers identified him as central to the smooth working of the world. He was considered as a divine being, a deity in human form, whose duty was to uphold and protect Dharma, the moral order of the universe. Navaratna nine gems is a powerful jewel frequently worn by a Maharaja emperor. It is an amulet, which comprises diamond, pearl, ruby, sapphire, emerald, topaz, cat's eye, coral, and hyacinth red zircon. Each of these stones is associated with a celestial deity, represented the totality of the Hindu universe when all nine gems are together. The diamond is the most powerful gem among the nine stones. There were various cuts for the gemstone. Indian kings bought gemstones privately from the sellers. 
Maharaja and other royal family members value gem as Hindu god. They exchanged gems with people to whom they were very close, especially the royal family members and other intimate allies. India was the first country to mine diamonds, with some mines dating back to 296 BC. India traded the diamonds, realizing their valuable qualities. Historically, diamonds have been given to retain or regain a lover's or ruler's lost favor, as symbols of tribute, or as an expression of fidelity in exchange for concessions and protection. Mughal emperors and kings used the diamonds as a means of assuring their immortality by having their names and worldly titles inscribed upon them. Moreover, it has played and continues to play a pivotal role in Indian social, political, economic, and religious event, as it often has done elsewhere. In Indian history, diamonds have been used to acquire military equipment, finance wars, foment revolutions, and tempt defections. They have contributed to the abdication or the decapitation of potentates. They have been used to murder a representative of the dominating power by lacing his food with crushed diamond. Indian diamonds have been used as security to finance large loans needed to buttress politically or economically tottering regimes. Victorious military heroes have been honored by rewards of diamonds and also have been used as ransom payment for release from imprisonment or abduction. Today, many of the jewelry designs and traditions are used, and jewelry is commonplace in Indian ceremonies and weddings. Topic: North and South America. Jewelry played a major role in the fate of the Americas when the Spanish established an empire to seize South American gold. Jewelry making developed in the Americas 5,000 years ago in Central and South America. Large amounts of gold was easily accessible, and the Aztecs, Mixtecs, Mayans, and numerous Andean cultures, such as the Mochica of Peru, created beautiful pieces of jewelry. With the Mochica culture, goldwork flourished. The pieces are no longer simple metalwork, but are now masterful examples of jewelry making. Pieces are sophisticated in their design, and feature inlays of turquoise, mother-of-pearl, spondylus shell, and amethyst. The nose and ear ornaments, chest plates, small containers and whistles are considered masterpieces of ancient Peruvian culture. Among the Aztecs, only nobility wore gold jewelry, as it showed their rank, power, and wealth. Gold jewelry was most common in the Aztec Empire and was often decorated with feathers from Quetzal birds and others. In general, the more jewelry an Aztec noble wore, the higher his status or prestige. The emperor and his high priests, for example, would be nearly completely covered in jewelry when making public appearances. Although gold was the most common and a popular material used in Aztec jewelry, jade, turquoise, and certain feathers were considered more valuable. In addition to adornment and status, the Aztecs also used jewelry and sacrifices to appease the gods. Priests also used gem-encrusted daggers to perform animal and human sacrifices. Another ancient American civilization with expertise in jewelry making were the Maya. At the peak of their civilization, the Maya were making jewelry from jade, gold, silver, bronze, and copper. Maya designs were similar to those of the Aztecs, with lavish headdresses and jewelry. The Maya also traded in precious gems. However, in earlier times, the Maya had little access to metal, so they made the majority of their jewelry out of bone or stone. Merchants and nobility were the only few that wore expensive jewelry in the Maya region, much the same as with the Aztecs. In North America, Native Americans used shells, wood, turquoise, and soapstone, almost unavailable in South and Central America. The turquoise was used in necklaces and to be placed in earrings. Native Americans with access to oyster shells, often located in only one location in America, traded the shells with other tribes, showing the great importance of the body adornment trade in Northern America. <laughs> Native American Native American jewelry is the personal adornment, often in the forms of necklaces, earrings, bracelets, rings, pins, brooches, labrets, and more, made by the indigenous peoples of the United States. Native American jewelry reflects the cultural diversity and history of its makers. 
Native American tribes continue to develop distinct aesthetics rooted in their personal artistic visions and cultural traditions. Artists create jewelry for adornment, ceremonies, and trade. Lois Cher Dubin writes, I, in the absence of written languages, adornment became an important element of Indian Native American communication, conveying many levels of information. Later, jewelry and personal adornment signaled resistance to assimilation. It remains a major statement of tribal and individual identity. Metalsmiths, beaters, carvers, and lapidaries combine a variety of metals, hardwoods, precious and semi-precious gemstones, beadwork, quillwork, teeth, bones, hide, vegetal fibers, and other materials to create jewelry. Contemporary Native American jewelry ranges from hand-quarried and processed stones and shells to computer-fabricated steel and titanium jewelry. Pacific Jewelry making in the Pacific started later than in other areas because of recent human settlement. Early Pacific jewelry was made of bone, wood, and other natural materials, and thus has not survived. Most Pacific jewelry is worn above the waist, with headdresses, necklaces, hair pins, and arm and waist belts being the most common pieces. Jewelry in the Pacific, with the exception of Australia, is worn to be a symbol of either fertility or power. Elaborate headdresses are worn by many Pacific cultures and some, such as the inhabitants of Papua New Guinea, wear certain headdresses once they have killed an enemy. Tribesmen may wear boar bones through their noses. Island jewelry is still very much primal because of the lack of communication with outside cultures. Some areas of Borneo and Papua New Guinea are yet to be explored by Western nations. However, the island nations that were flooded with Western missionaries have had drastic changes made to their jewelry designs. Missionaries saw any type of tribal jewelry as a sign of the wearer's devotion to paganism. Thus many tribal designs were lost forever in the mass conversion to Christianity. Australia is now the number one supplier of opals in the world. Opals had already been mined in Europe and South America for many years prior, but in the late 19th century, the Australian opal market became predominant. Australian opals are only mined in a few select places around the country, making it one of the most profitable stones in the Pacific. The New Zealand Maori traditionally had a strong culture of personal adornment, most famously the hei tiki. Hei tikis are traditionally carved by hand from bone, nephrite, or boanite. Nowadays a wide range of such traditionally inspired items such as bone carved pendants based on traditional fishhooks hei matau and other greenstone jewellery are popular with young New Zealanders of all backgrounds, for whom they relate to a generalised sense of New Zealand identity. These trends have contributed towards a worldwide interest in traditional Maori culture and arts. Other than jewellery created through Maori influence, modern jewellery in New Zealand is multicultural and varied. <laughs> modern Most modern commercial jewellery continues traditional forms and styles, but designers such as Georg Jensen have widened the concept of wearable art. The advent of new materials, such as plastics, precious metal clay PMC, and coloring techniques, has led to increased variety in styles. Other advances, such as the development of improved pearl harvesting by people such as Mikimoto Kokichi and the development of improved quality artificial gemstones such as moissanite, a diamond simulant, has placed jewelry within the economic grasp of a much larger segment of the population. The Jewelry as art. Movement was spearheaded by artisans such as Robert Lee Morris and continued by designers such as Gil Forsbrook in the UK. Influence from other cultural forms is also evident. One example of this is bling bling style jewelry, popularized by hip hop and rap artists in the early 21st century, e.g., grills, a type of jewelry worn over the teeth. The late 20th century saw the blending of European design with Oriental techniques such as Mokum Gain. The following are innovations in the decades straddling the year 2000. 
Mokum gain, hydraulic die forming, anti clastic raising, fold forming, reactive metal anodizing, shell forms, PMC, photoetching, and use of CAD, CAM. Also, 3D printing as a production technique gains more and more importance. With a great variety of services offering this production method, jewelry design becomes accessible to a growing number of creatives. An important advantage of using 3D printing are the relatively low costs for prototypes, small batch series or unique and personalized designs. Shapes that are hard or impossible to create by hand can often be realized by 3D printing. Popular materials to print include polyamide, steel and wax latter for further processing. Every printable material has its very own constraints that have to be considered while designing the piece of jewelry using 3D modeling software. Artisan jewelry continues to grow as both a hobby and a profession. With more than 17 United States periodicals about beading alone, resources, accessibility, and a low initial cost of entry continues to expand production of handmade adornments. Some fine examples of artisan jewelry can be seen at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. The increase in numbers of students choosing to study jewellery design and production in Australia has grown in the past 20 years, and Australia now has a thriving contemporary jewellery community. Many of these jewellers have embraced modern materials and techniques, as well as incorporating traditional workmanship. More expansive use of metal to adorn the wearer, where the piece is larger and more elaborate than what would normally be considered jewelry, has come to be referred to by designers and fashion writers as metal couture. Topic: <laughs> Masonic. Freemasons attach jewels to their detachable collars when in lodge to signify a brother's office held with the lodge. For example, the square represents the master of the lodge and the dove represents the deacon. Topic: <inaudible> Body modification. Jewelry used in body modification can be simple and plain or dramatic and extreme. The use of simple silver studs, rings, and earrings predominates. Common jewelry pieces such as earrings are a form of body modification, as they are accommodated by creating a small hole in the ear. Padong women in Myanmar place large golden rings around their necks. From as early as five years old, girls are introduced to their first neck ring. Over the years, more rings are added. In addition to the 20 plus pounds of rings on her neck, a woman will also wear just as many rings on her calves. At their extent, some necks modified like this can reach 10 to 15 and 25 to 38 centimeters long. The practice has health impacts and has in recent years declined from cultural norm to tourist curiosity. Tribes related to the Paduang, as well as other cultures throughout the world, use jewelry to stretch their earlobes or enlarge ear piercings. In the Americas, labrays have been worn since before first contact by Innu and First Nations peoples of the northwest coast. Lip plates are worn by the African Mercy and Sara people, as well as some South American peoples. In the late 20th century, the influence of modern primitivism led to many of these practices being incorporated into Western subcultures. Many of these practices rely on a combination of body modification and decorative objects, thus keeping the distinction between these two types of decoration blurred. In many cultures, jewelry is used as a temporary body modifier, in some cases, with hooks or other objects being placed into the recipient's skin. Although this procedure is often carried out by tribal or semi-tribal groups, often acting under a trance during religious ceremonies, this practice has seeped into Western culture. Many extreme jewelry shops now cater to people wanting large hooks or spikes set into their skin. Most often, these hooks are used in conjunction with pulleys to hoist the recipient into the air. This practice is said to give an erotic feeling to the person and some couples have even performed their marriage ceremony whilst being suspended by hooks. Jewelry market 
According to a 2007 KPMG study, the largest jewelry market is the United States with a market share of 30.8%, Japan, India, China, and the Middle East each with 8-9%, and Italy with 5%. The authors of the study predict a dramatic change in market shares by 2015, where the market share of the United States will have dropped to around 25%, and China and India will increase theirs to over 13%. The Middle East will remain more or less constant at 9%, whereas Europe's and Japan's market share will be halved and become less than 4% for Japan, and less than 3% for the biggest individual European countries, Italy and the UK equals equals see also